Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War Update Extra video, giving you extra tidbits and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. Uh, I'm a little bit later to it today. I got caught, sucked into season two of Welcome to Wrexham. Anyway, that's irrelevant. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping as in what's going on, hopefully on either the 1st or 2nd of October, Operator Starsky, I'll be interviewing him. That will be hopefully fantastic. Although I don't, I might have to do it on my other, or on this channel, a Tippling Philosopher channel, as opposed to my ATP Geopolitics channel, because of the whole mess up that's going on. I haven't decided yet, but we'll see how that goes. Right, let's go on to talk, first of all, about Crimea. This is an article in The Economist. War has arrived in Crimea, and it's kind of on the back of all the strikes that have taken place in Crimea. And it, it details some of those. So the attacks on the Black Sea, the landing ship, the Minsk, the submarine Rostov-on-Don, the naval headquarters, hits all around uh, Crimea, air raid sirens, cruise missiles, drones, the whole lot, right? So Ukrainian military sources say the operations are not necessarily ends in themselves. They should rather be seen as auxiliaries to two more important efforts. The first, so as with so many things in life, it's a case of looking at the functionality of our actions of, of doing things, right? Uh, yes, there might be occasions where things have intrinsic value in, value in and of themselves, but quite often we do things in order to achieve other things. So, you know, the fighting in Bakhmut isn't fighting for Bakhmut. It doesn't have the intrinsic value. The fighting is to fix a, uh, the Russian troops and to trip them. So, you know, what's the function of fighting in Bakhmut? What's the function of these strikes? Uh, and that's kind of what this talks to. So the first is U Ukraine's ongoing land counteroffensive, focused on the Zaporizhia region to the northeast of Crimea. Any Ukrainian success in degrading air power, railways and logistics, they say, undermines the Russian troops there who are directly supplied from the peninsula. So hitting the peninsula is affecting the front line in Zaporizhia. The second focus is a naval contest in the Black Sea. Here, Ukraine is trying to deny Russia a monopoly of the sea and to regain control of vital shipping routes. It is destroying Russian warships wherever it can and pushing the rest out to a distance that makes striking ports, cities and a new sea corridor as difficult as possible. The process began in April 2022 uh, with the sinking of Russia's flagship Moskva hit with a home-produced Neptune cruise missile that the Navy wasn't sure even worked. Since then, Ukraine has sunk or damaged at least 19 Russian ships. Ukraine's economy rests on the success of, the new, of a new sea corridor in and out of Odessa, announced in August in the wake of Russia's refusal to extend a grain deal. The safety of the route, which hugs the shoreline in, inside Ukrainian territorial waters, depends on two things. A bet that Russia will not target civilian ships sailing under neutral flags, and a viable threat of retaliation should that not prove enough. The latter is already real. At the start of the war, Russian warships were positioned menacingly close to Odessa. Today, they rarely enter the northwestern Black Sea, a remarkable achievement of a Ukrainian Navy without a single operational warship. Quote, the Ukrainians have adapted to become a mosquito fleet using naval drones, missiles and artillery, says John Foreman, a former British defence attaché in Moscow and Kyiv. Quote, it's a classic sea denial strategy that others used against the British Royal Navy in the past. Ukraine's strategists have consistently identified Crimea and as Russia's Achilles heel, crucial to its ability to project power and to hold and hold on to occupied territories, but vulnerable to being cut off. An article co-written in September 2022 by Ukraine's commander in chief Valery Zaluzhny highlighted the need to make, quote, feelings of discomfort in Crimea more acute, natural, and tangible. New circumstances have added urgency to that aim. The counteroffensive has not yet produced the breakthrough many had hoped for. Specifically, it has not brought Crimea into artillery range from the north. The pressure is on to show results in another way. It goes on the article to talk about how there are these new drones. You've got the Sea Baby drone. You've got the Marichka, which is that torpedo drone I showed you recently. Uh, other types of missiles, cruise missiles, obviously the Neptune, so on and so forth. 
Hannah Shelest, a security expert based in Odessa, says Ukraine will not have to look far for expertise. The one-time missile superpower. So this is interesting. Like you know, Ukraine had military expertise. It's not like Ukraine is this poor military cousin that that needs you know a leg up all the time from from the West. Yes, it needs assistance, but it also has experience and expertise of its own. And one of those has been in. Um, you know, claim here m- missiles it being once being part of a missile superpower and a kind of superpower in itself. As in, you know, when it was part of the Soviet Union, the USSR, it had many, you know, decent manufacturing facilities that that, were, that was making stuff for the USSR. Anyway, they were mothballed because of lack of finance or, in some cases, sabotage. Quote: There were many cases uh, where. Documents disappeared or were not signed. Sorry. Uh, the one-time missile superbat had a handful of crazy world-class projects under development before 2014. Sorry, I missed that sentence. She says, they were mothballed because of a lack of finance or in some cases sabotage. There were many cases where documents disappeared or were not signed. Some of these projects have been dusted off, creating a new missile, usually takes around 10 years, but bringing older prototypes to market will be much quicker. Interesting. So they, you know, they are going to be taking on new Western missiles, like hopefully a Tacoms, hopefully Taurus. Obviously, they've got Storm Shadow and Scouts. Although the question is, what stocks of those do they have, and how sustainable is is a continued use of them? Russia, it finishes the article finishes, is adjusting its tactics in response to the new threat. It has moved some of its ships to safer ports like Novorossiysk across the Black Sea. But the psychological importance of Crimea to put Mr. Putin's rule uh, to Mr. Putin's rule means he is likely to cling on. Ukraine has significantly degraded Russia's naval power ratio, an operational measure it uses to take account of drones, radar, shore-based artillery, and so forth, as well as warships. Though it is still a long way from parity. At the start of the war, its navy put that that ratio. So the Ukrainian navy put the ratio of twelve to one. Now I'd love to know how they calculated this. It'd be fascinating. But they saw that the that before the war started, the Russian navy had a twelve to one naval power ratio to the Ukrainian navy. I would have thought it might have even been more than that. I wonder if that's particularly. Uh, pertinent to the Black Sea, maybe, or uh, I don't know. But anyway, because the Russian Navy is is a pretty pretty sizable um, thing. But anyway, Ukraine now says today it stands at four to one. Now, considering the Ukrainians don't have any navy, again, I'd love to know how that's calculated. Obviously, as they say, you know, it's not just about the warships; it's about radar, shore based artillery, drones, so on and so forth. But four to one from twelve to one is obviously a huge improvement quote the russians still have the upper hand admits captain ryshenko yeah interesting anyway uh that that is just a little dip into crimea and how important crimea is for other places it's not just hitting crimea for the sake of hitting crimea it's for the effect that that has on the logistics for example just one reason for the logistics uh, up to the zaporizhia front line and kherson front line it's also about um keeping the Russian Black Sea fleet back and away from the Ukrainian grain corridor down that uh, coast of Ukraine and then the coast of Romania and Bulgaria out the Bosphorus Strait. Right, let's move on to talk about a Tatragami thread. This is uh, on logistics. This is uh, him saying Russian railroads are a critical component of their logistics so russia is a railway army it's got a whole railway army kind of um they have railway units uh much more than say the royal engineers or whatever in in the british army like they are full-on a railway army and this is why at the beginning of the war the ukrainians worked really hard to disable train lines that came in from russia to ukraine uh, so they you know blew up train lines they flooded areas they, they did all sorts of stuff took out bridges um and that meant that the russians had to move things by truck and it was at the time of the year where there's an awful lot of mud they had very poorly maintained trucks and not enough of them because they're not a truck army they're a railway army as i've said a million times the Russians had 4,000 trucks, I think it was, to do what the Americans would take 100,000 trucks to do. 
So, because they do most things by rail. So you take that rail component out and then they're in trouble. So railway or constraining Russia's railway use is a, is a supremely important objective for the Ukrainians. Russian railroads, says Tatogami, are a critical component of their logistics, allowing the rapid and cost-efficient movement of substantial quantities of ammunition, vehicles, fuel construction materials, fuel construction materials, and personnel. Here's a brief thread about with an update on their logistical operations. It's also worth noting that the Russians don't use pallets and they don't use forklift trucks. So even though they're a railway army, they appear to just load most of their stuff by hand. Just uh, pretty insane. Uh, for a better understanding, let's examine Kantemirovka, a train station in Voronezh Oblast. This is in Russia, right across the northern part of Luhansk Oblast, situated out of the range of artillery and high mars. It's located only a few hours from the critical logistical hubs like Starobilsk. So you've got Starobilsk here, and you've got just over the border, it appears, this, this railway um, in Voronezh. Um, so, yeah. Uh, anyway, in this case, the satellite has recorded the unloading of equipment and vehicles from uh, the train. This typically starts either late at night or early in the morning and finishes by dawn or noon, respectively. Here, many trucks with ammo and equipment had already left. Russian occupational forces frequently unload trains during late nights and early mornings. Firstly, it allows them to reduce the number of witnesses who could record a video or take a photo. Moreover, it helps them avoid detection by optical satellites like this one. Regrettably, the destruction of a single railway track does not inflict significant damage, as it can be quickly repaired. Moreover, due to the number of available tracks, the Russians can easily reroute these trains, resulting in a relatively minor increase in transit time. This is something that, that I've talked about a lot, which is if you're going to hit railway logistics, you want to blow up a bridge or you want to take out the logistics, you know, the serious logistics at a railway station. Um, because actually it's just blowing up some track will i mean if you're going to use a storm shadow missile to take out a stretch of track that's going to be a hugely expensive and wasteful use of uh, ammunition uh, of ordnance you, yeah so bridges are important because you can't you know rebuild bridges particularly easily uh, following the offloading process trucks transport the cargo to smaller facilities at the battalion or even company level consequently attempting to target such a limited quantity with longer range missiles would be an inefficient use given their limited availability while this approach adds logistical strain initially the russians heavily relied on civilian trucks during the refurbishment and recovery of the old truck fleet at the time of writing it appears they've successfully successfully transitioned to military trucks for these operations. As the war continues and drone technology advances, I think the deployment of expendable drones with modest production costs and reasonable payloads. So there's this sweet spot, isn't there? It, you, you, you can use a storm shadow to hit a bit of railway here or some, some form of logistics or building here. And you're thinking, okay, that's however many millions of dollars or whatever to take out something. Uh, okay, that's it's not worth it. Let's, okay, but if we go down to really cheap drone, then it's just going to bounce off one of these buildings. Okay, so at some point, you have your trade-off of, of distance, payload, cost, um, uh, and, you know, ramifications for doing what you've done. Impact, you know, battle damage assessment, and so on and so forth. So you put all those together and and it's finding the right weapon for the for the right job um so as as it says i think that the deployment of expendable drones with modest production costs and reasonable payloads capable of being delivered over several hundred kilometers will become a significant risk factor for russian logistics additionally i want to highlight that systems like storm shadow and atacums cannot be used against russian territory this leaves limited alternatives primarily domestic production with its own constraints and increasingly drones as a viable option for deeper strikes this is a very good point that of course when you do have so something like Atakums. Atakums might be a perfect sort of you put a cluster cluster munition Atakums or, or or four cluster munition Atakums across that that area there that you're seeing, and you can cause some serious damage, right? Uh but you can't use them in, in into Russia as according to you know the generally the agreements that are being made. But that's really frustrating for the Ukrainians because then they have to use either drones that might not be as effective um or their own 
indigenous weapons that might not have the same capability or they don't have enough of them something like the neptune um but yeah Right, oh, we're going to now talk um, about corruption in Russia. This is a Chris O'Wiki thread. Russia's Ground Forces Combat Training Center, uh, reportedly the country's only fully modern military training base, has been seriously hampered by repeated episodes of corruption and money laundering, as well as the impact of Western sanctions. The facility at Molino in the uh, Nizhny Novgorod region was the controversial focus of a project to equip it by the German company Rheinmetall. Interesting. The uh, Kamil Kazani, uh, Kamil Galiv, um, thread below, so that, that is uh, another source, highlights a now deleted page from the company's website. I won't go into that. In practice, however, Molino is reported by the VCHK OGPU, so that's a Telegram channel that Chris Wiki, Chris o. Wiki uses a lot to get some of this Russian information, uh, to have been systematically looted by its managers and contractors, which has led to equipment not being installed and construction work not being carried out. According to the Telegram channel, quote, the other day, the heads of the firm VSK, formerly SD Atrium, Tatiana Alyabieva and Peter Dorofiev were arrested. The investigative committee accuses them of money laundering through controlled shell companies. According to the investigation, Alyabieva and Dorofiev, having entered into an agreement with the general construction contractor, FSUEGVSU, for special objects, transferred about 29 million rubles, that's $301,000, out of the 429 million, 4.4 million. Uh, dollars allocated under the contract to affiliated offices. The construction deadlines were missed, the work was abandoned, and the allocated advance payment at 72 million rubles or $748,000 was simply squandered with the pretense of hectic activity at the construction site. The saga of theft at the combat training center has been going on for many years. Earlier, uh, Pavel Nosov, head of the GS GVSU, Special Facilities Service was detained by counterintelligence for kickbacks. He took bribes from civilian contractors who were involved in the construction of the centre. And the initiator of this construction of the century in Molina was ex-minister Anatoly Serdyukov. But the equipment was not delivered due to sanctions and the construction site was plundered by literally everyone. For example, almost 600 million rubles, $6.2 million, were recovered from these respo those responsible for the project, the head of the Military Scientific Committee under the General Staff of the Russian Federation, O. Gazenko, and the ex-head of the 853rd Military Representative Office of the Ministry of Defence, E. Chikin. True, they got off with a suspended sentence, which is unlikely to happen to Dorofiev and Aliabiva, uh, who stole the money. Molino was featured in many of Russia's highest profile training exercises, including the large scale Vostok exercises. The training has been criticized for being excessively scripted and unrealistic. The facility's reported deficiencies are likely to have helped. I mean, we see this an awful lot with, with construction projects. There was that um, one of the really expensive military centers in, was it in Moscow uh, that was involved in, in, corruption scandals with the person who built it really high up in the Russian military, you know, on the take and, and all sorts. There's just project after project like this mired in, in corruption and controversy and just uh, you know, it's further evidence that, that Russia, there's something rotten in the state of Russia, right? It, right at the heart of Russia. And it, it it's, comes from the top down. You know, if you've got, if you have a kleptocracy, which is built around stealing money from the people, really, um, when you've got an oligarchy that's concentrating all the money in the whole country into very few. I mean, you talk about in America about 98%, the other 2%, right? The, it, this is even more co concentrated in Russia, where you have very few insanely rich people, elites that have, have gone around hoovering up um, the the national industries at the end of the Soviet Union, and uh, you know, as as they flirted with capitalism, but they took it in 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 the worst direction possible, which is you know, kleptocracy, stealing, corruption, um, oligarchy, which you know, cartels. Uh, yeah, it's just it's it's a it's a pretty broken system. But uh, as I say, it starts from the top. So when you look at 
at Putin as a leader of this country, who's not only changed all the rules so that he's going to be leader forever type thing. Uh, so there's, there's, it's reneged on all its democratic intentions. Uh, it has is deconstructed all the democratic institutions and checks and balances. So th th there's no transparency there. But you also have Vladimir Putin as the richest human being on the planet. And you're thinking, how is an FSB officer that is because that was then mayor of St. Petersburg and then head of the country. Like, how are you the richest man on earth? Like, I can understand it if you were, because you look at like David Cameron or, or Obama or Bush or whatever, all these people that run countries, you're like, yeah, you're pretty rich and you've done fairly well out of it, but you haven't stolen from the country. What you've done is, is after you finish being a leader, you've done like a talking tour around the world, and you know you've paid X and Y and for for your memoirs and all this, and you become really rich. Putin is ruling, and as he's ruling, he's the richest man on earth, and he's got golden palace near the Black Sea, and he's got all this stuff, and his his you know wife and daughter that have never done anything have suddenly got like billions of dollars. Like how have you, you you've done nothing in your lives and you've suddenly got billion like there there are people connected to Putin like lovers and illegitimate children or whatever you've suddenly got billions of dollars you're like where's that come from? The only thing that can explain all of this data is that it's stolen is corruption. Now it starts from the top. It's rotten at the top. It's going to be rotten all the way down. It's giving it's giving everyone else permission. Like Putin's. Uh, people around him see his opulence, right? See, and they know his richness. They they know how he's got it. They're not stupid, right? So they look, look at him and they're like, well, if he can do that, I can do that. And then the people under them see that above them. They're like, well, if they do that, I'm going to do that. It starts at the top. The rot starts at the top. Uh, oh, it's coextensive, maybe. Yeah, there's an element of him learning that as he goes up and you know taking that with him but it's probably always been there in in many different ways during both the soviet era i mean you only have to look at animal farm i know it's a, it's a parody it's an allegory but the idea is that the all of those people under under the pretenses of taking over a farm and having it on behalf of everyone and it's collective it's community but at the end they kind of bend the rules and change things and sort everything out for themselves and that's that was a perfectly prescient um you know account of of soviet russia and also post soviet russia sorry soviet union and you know post ussr russia you know both in its its communist form and its quasi capitalist form just uh co corruption is rampant and it's 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 not good <laughs> it's I don't know how any pro-Russian can look at Ukraine and have a go at Ukraine for being corrupt, right? And and to to focus on all, all these issues of corruption when Russia is, I mean, it's just blatantly hypocritical. It's not to say that there isn't corruption in Ukraine, but they're fighting really hard to get rid of it, and they have to because it's part of their future. They won't accede to the to to NATO to the. EU, they won't get funding from the World Bank if they don't sort their corruption issues out and work on their transparency. So they are doing that and they're working hard and they're moving up the transparency uh, index. So that's that's good news. Whereas Russia are going in the wrong direction and, you know, buck stops with Putin, right? Okay, now we're going to go on to uh, Anton Gerashchenko here, who, just to remind you, in case you don't know, is the Minister of Internal Affairs for Ukraine, advisor to the minister, sorry. I sometimes see Westerners, he says, saying that the more human losses Russia sustains, the more injured and traumatised Russians return back home, the sooner public opinion will change and Russians will start opposing the war. Time for a tea break. This is something I've uh, thought about quite a lot, which is, you know, surely when they see people coming back, but I do understand it works both ways as he's going to talk about. You know, when you see people coming back, uh, friends and family are either in a body bag or, or injured and you think, oh my God, what a terrible war, this is all pointless. Or you think, you complete bastards, let's go even harder in on this. And this is what this talks to. So 
Many Ukrainians, including myself, have thought so too in the first months of the war. We addressed Russian mothers, Russian women, told them that their sons and husbands will be killed or maimed. We got very little feedback and virtually no results. For the Russians, these dead soldiers are heroes who protected the motherland, and Russians choose to see them this way, empowered by propaganda and ideology. Russia is very good at heroizing the dead. They refuse to realize that it was their country that invaded another state, their country that kills, loots, rapes and injures civilians in Ukraine, that these Russian soldiers are murderers and villains. In fact, for many of the Russian women, life becomes better with their men gone. A lot of them had drinking problems, abused their families, did not work proper jobs. Usually the people who got mobil get mobilized or signed contracts with the Russian army are from specific social circles. The educated middle class, or a broad generalization of course, is not keen to go to war. Usually it's poorer men from distant villages who are in the trenches. This also is a subject matter I was talking about with regard to why there is a skew towards um, ethnic minorities going from Russia and while it may be prima facie racism it might be that they're making um, quotas for these distant areas because they, they discriminate against them so someone in St. Petersburg or, or Moscow is saying yeah you guys need to get X amount of people whereas you, they go to the local recruiters in St. Petersburg yeah you only need to get this many there may be prima facie racism going on there but it's more likely that it's down the line kind of racism which is that or not discrimination uh, or both where they've underfunded the regions because they're just the regions uh, where it's all about Moscow and St. Petersburg uh, and Yekaterinburg maybe so you know they uh, all the money that that gets from the oligarchy from the kleptocracy that's that's running the country all that money gets um, focused in on only certain areas certain cities and the towns and the backwater places in Russia and these regions out to the east and north of the Caucasus and so on and so forth, they get forgotten. And because they're forgotten, then they they breed kind of low aspiration societies or communities. And low aspiration communities, you know, breed people who who struggle to be able to get social mobility there are fewer opportunities there so how do you get out of that problem well you sign up to go to war because that gets you some money that gets you a job it gets you secure money and hopefully you know you can move up the ranks and afford a house and all this so war is a form of social mobility an opportunity and and therefore there are communities out in the in in the east of, of russia where it seems like they are recruiting more of them and you might think it's because of discriminatory quotas but it's because those people are more likely to volunteer because that's their route out of poverty right i know i've said that many times before but you know repetition is good for learning and all that um so Usually it's poor men from distant villages who are in the trenches. So now these women can live freely and get a substantial amount of money from the government living with a glossed over memory of their son, husband or father. I mean, it's pretty damning this and you could take issue maybe with the broad brush strokes that he's making here but the general point i think is salient in a way that reassures them that russia is doing everything right and as russia has over 140 million people it has virtually endless resources of cannon fodder um as for the injured russia mostly hides its invalids inside so no one sees them and remembers them after world war ii people were, who lost limbs or had other deformities were even sent to special colonies so they wouldn't get in uh contrast with the shiny myth of the great victory what russians don't see they don't care about so these incredible losses of the russian army serve more to mobilize and inspire the russian society and increase putin's approval ratings this prolongs the war and the longer the war lasts the harder it will be to overpower russia and every day russia becomes a bigger problem for the whole world in, in other words like it's, it's it's almost like this putin paradox i talked about previously which is the better russia the better ukraine do the more likely it, it it looks that Russia will lose. And since the war is, is an existential crisis for Putin alone, it's not an existential crisis for Russia. It's literally Putin's gone on in on this war. It's such a bad decision that actually his very life depends on the war, on, on Russia prevailing. Because if Russia 
screw up then he gets deposed and could well be lynched and end up being dead with you know there's not going to be a peaceful transfer of power or he he ends up you know being deposed in another way where he still remains alive but he might be put in prison he might end up going to the hague whatever it's, it's like the only so that's why i've always said that the only way this war can win or the, sorry the only way this war can end is if putin isn't in power it will not end with Putin in power because he's existentially connected to the outcome of the war. So you get this paradox. So the better you, Ukraine do, the more likely Putin is to do something nuts like press the red button. I know it's more complex than that in triggering nuclear missiles, of course. But you get the idea that he's more likely to do something insane the closer it gets to Ukraine prevailing. And that's a bit of a, a kind of a paradox because you kind of you want them to prevail but you don't want them to prevail because it could it could all go south. In 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 this sense, like the 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 more body bags that come back, the more entrenched the Russian society becomes and blames Ukraine for those body bags. Is the, is the point here? So it's like it's frustrating because you you want you know, Ukrainians to to prevail and and to attrit the Russian forces as much as possible, but actually it might have a like a. a counterproductive effect so he says what to do then it's important to destroy disrupt and break down russia's military potential as quickly as possible that is what ukraine is doing with attacking plants that produce military goods breaking down logistical chains taking down headquarters and so on that is why it's so important for ukraine to get long-range missiles i broadly agree i mean it, attriting troops is one thing but hammering the ability for russia to prosecute a war by taking out logistics, by taking out really key installations, that gives you possibly a better chance of having really, you know, really lasting effect on Russia's ability to, to, to win the war. Another crucial thing is combating Russian propaganda. It's a source of war and a huge part of it. Russian propagandists are war criminals. Severe personal sanctions are needed, not just against the most known figures but against everyone who serves that machine uh, i don't disagree with that at all uh thank you mr gerishchenko right this is just you know that russians are the bad guys in this when even nature is having a go at russia absolutely love this this is good good stuff here this is a russian boat <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> oh, let's just that's that's just delightful. Yeah, I did that. <laughs> that was me. Brilliant. That is one big fella just letting his views be known. He's like, you are not welcome here. I've heard what you've done in Ukraine. And you're not bringing that mess it, messing around here. It's not happening. Do one. Do one, Russia. Be gone. <coughs> yeah. Well done, nature. Okay. Uh, and the last thing I, I'm going to leave you with is, 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 a, is a nice heartwarming a uh, bit of imagery. Marina is Ukraine's first child to be fitted with a paediatric prosthesis. In May 2022, a Russian missile struck the house in which she lived with her parents in the Kherson region. The child's leg was amputated above the knee at a hospital in Krivyry. Today, six-year-old Marina is already learning how to ride a bicycle. And this is the Kiev Institute of Rehabilitation. Fantastic stuff. Heartwarming, hopefully, and a good positive way to end, even though she should never have lost a leg. It never would have happened if Russia kept themselves to themselves. Because I, I, as soon as I, I saw this, before I realised she had an amputation, I was like, oh, you shouldn't ride with stabilisers, you need a balance bike. And I was like, oh, no, no, she's, she hasn't got, she hasn't got one leg. Right, come on, stop being, stop being an idiot, Pierce. So, uh, yes. That's fa fantastic, and you know, look how happy she looks. Uh, and uh, well, I think she does. Um, 
it's really good news and and so much uh, effort is going to have to go into stuff like this but actually more challenging will be the amount of uh resources that r ukraine are going to need and russia too in terms of psychological rehabilitation for people on the front line and people not on the front line people who have been you know will get ptsd and all sorts of things from uh you know different different experiences they've had in being bombed and whatever andrew perpetual on his live stream was talking about someone who's going through a like, really heavy rehabilitation that was hit with um I can't remember, it might have been a missile somewhere and he had, he was a soldier and he had like all four limbs were really affected. And anyway, he was, he was completely, you know, doing really well. And then suddenly he just went into psychosis, some kind of PTSD psychosis and has now gone completely off the rails. You know, he had a, like a following on Instagram or whatever and just gone completely off the rails. And it's like how challenging it is to keep people on a straight and narrow after you've had such massive, massive um, trauma. Uh, and so I said I was going to end on a positive, and I'm not, am I? Uh, the challenges for Ukraine in terms of rehabilitating so many people across society will be felt for generations, of course. And, um, you know, with we, here we've got a six-year-old girl who's having to, will have to deal with, with that trauma and the physical ramifications of a missile striking her house. Um, so yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, please like, subscribe and share. Really appreciate all of your support. Sorry this is on my other channel. I'm just trying to like work out how to, to deal with uh, what's going on with my other channel and the whole demonetization thing. I'm still waiting to hear back from youtube on that but anyway really appreciate all of your kind words and emails that you sent thank you so much and all the support take care speak to you soon